Hello, 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 beautiful people. Let us get started. Today, we are going to witness the rise of Napoleon. We will look at the radical phase of the revolution, the directory phase of the revolution, and then finally, we will get to know a little bit about our Corsican friend, Napoleon. We last left off with the revolution in full swing. We have put a king on trial for treason. He tried to escape, raise an army. He is a counter-revolutionary in the fullest. We tried to work with him. We tried to make a constitutional monarchy work, but he refused. He betrayed the revolution. He betrayed the people. And so he is put on trial. And he is, of course, found guilty. There was no question about that. And after addressing the crowd, hoping that they will not meet the same fate, we kill our king. We've killed our king. This not only sends shockwaves through France, and it certainly does. Remember, there are counter-revolutionaries. There are royalists that are in the countryside still fighting against this revolution. This is more of a Parisian revolution with the rest of France being dragged in. Not only does it shock many in France, we're all in France, Europe and the United States and parts of the rest of the world are shocked as well. This plunges Europe into war. This plunges Europe into war. The martyr of equality is gone. We see Spain, Britain, Austria, Prussia against France. France is not only fighting against all of the major powers of Europe, uh, she is fighting against herself. Again, everything uh, that is purple on this map represents counter-revolutionaries. These are people that are loyal to the dead king now, but his son lives on, um, and nobles as well as many members of the clergy are still against this revolution. And the revolution uh, begins to eat itself. Not only is it fighting enemies outside of France, it is fighting enemies within France. We are entering the radical phase. We are under the control of the Jacobins and the sans culottes. Uh, the revolution becomes much more radical by 1793. And this is a term given to this period where the revolution is under the control of the Committee of Public Safety. The radical phase is when we are under the control of the Jacobin, sans culottes, um, and the Committee of Public Safety. We're going to get to that in just a moment. Um, but look at this. Look at this sign. Um, liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. We see liberty, fraternity, equality still today in France on their money, on their... Uh, national buildings, but we forget about that last part. Well, you couldn't forget about that last part during the radical phase. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. Remember, some men need to be forced to be free. And if you are against the revolution, if you're against those ideals, then death. That is a central part of this phase of the revolution. All Opposition is opposition against freedom, against the general will, against the French people. Let's re-examine very briefly this concept of the general will introduced by Rousseau. Rousseau's dead by the time we get to the French Revolution, but he has gained a godlike status among many of the revolutionaries. And Rousseau argued that the general will is always right. He says that the general will is always right. The majority, if the majority are saying something, then you have to trust the people. This is, he, it's, it's, it's a very democratic position. I'm going to paraphrase what he said about the general. This isn't a direct quote, but in short, he argued the law will be made by the general will of the people in this perfect society that the French are now trying to create. The law is in the best interests of the people. The law must therefore be enforced upon everyone. The problem is 
Who gets to decide what the general will is? Who decides what the general will is? That will be the uh, Committee of Public Safety. We're going to get there in a moment. But just know that from 1789 onwards, the general will becomes a constant phrase by supporters of the revolution. Also, please know that Rousseau most likely would not have supported most or at least many of the things that we're talking about in this revolution. He's gone. But ideas have a way of evolving, um, and he's not there to raise any objections. And so we won't hear from him during this time. But his ideas are very much alive. And the general will is repeated over and over again in pamphlets, in songs, in poems. You couldn't go into a Jacobean club and not hear the general will. To make any kind of claims on legitimacy, the speaker had to bring this term, this phrase, into their uh, discourse. But again, who decides the general will? What is the general will? Well, the Committee of Public Safety gets to decide, and I love this the name they gave themselves. Um, always be careful when government organizations name themselves these very nice terms. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security. That sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Uh, but just, just I'm not saying anything about the don't report me. I'm not saying anything bad about them. Um, but it's just interesting. This, the, the terms uh, governments give to certain agencies. I have no problem with the Homeland Security for the record. OK, let's move on very quickly. In April of 1793, the convention established a committee of public safety to perform executive duties of the government. The goal, destroy enemies both within and outside of France. This is the executive body of the French government at this time. It's a committee. It's instead of a president or a king, we have a committee. And they're tasked with cleansing France of counter-revolutionary thought and action. Eventually, the committee enjoys almost dictatorial powers. This is a, a time, by the way, that the Jacobins completely dominate the convention and completely dominate this committee. By September of 1793, more laws are passed by the convention, which was under the control of the Committee of Public Safety. I'm going to give you some of these laws passed that gives the committee dictatorial powers and makes France much more of a dictatorship than a republic. One, revolutionary armies were established. We're going to see in a moment how they were established. Two, farmers are now forced to surrender grain demanded by the government. We need to feed the people. Three, prices were fixed for essential goods. You can't price gouge the people. The government sets the prices of those essential goods. Four, wages are now fixed by the government. Finally, law of suspects was passed. What is law of suspects? This was a decree which authorized the charging of counter-revolutionaries with vaguely defined, quote, crimes against liberty. You could be charged with crimes against liberty on the most gray of statements. And the government could present the slightest evidence against you. Oftentimes, there won't even be a trial. When there is a trial, it's a sham of a trial. But again, some men need to be forced to be free. The Committee of Public Safety, the Committee of Public Safety, God help you if they give you attention. God help you. Dictatorial powers, dictatorial powers. Now, how does revolutionary France raise an army to take on all of Europe, which they're going to do, which they are going to do? Well, the levy in mass, the levy system, they introduced the draft. They introduced forced conscription. In 1793, it was decreed that all able-bodied unmarried men between the ages of 18 and 25 are required to enlist. Now, despite massive desertion and massive evasion, uh, within a year, almost three quarters of a million men were now in the army. 
This gives a huge bolster to the revolutionary spirit of France. These young men were presented as the ideal of uh, what it means to be a French man. They were giving uniforms. They were pumped full of patriotic songs, patriotic newspapers. Revolutionary spirit was strong. Within the military itself, who was promoted was based on merit for the most part, not seniority. And so this actually helps the military a lot. How? What's more Republican in spirit than to be promoted on uh, merit rather than uh, seniority or who your father was? Up until this time, before this time, under the, the king, um, officers were promoted, usually uh, depending on their title. No more, no more. This is a Republican army. This is a Republican army army. Uh, needy parents, wives, or dependents of soldiers received subsidies. Common soldiers seriously wounded in action earned extremely generous veterans benefits. These are well-disciplined, for the most part, well-trained national soldiers. Um, and the result is a massive and radicalized army. The ideals of the revolution are pumped into them. They, they are radicalized oftentimes within the ranks of the military. This is how France takes on Europe. It was the Committee of Public Safety and other radicals who sought to de-Christianize France. To radicals within the revolution, Christianity had been a tool for the last 1,500 years to enslave the minds of the French people. The clergy, priests, have exploited the people. They've told them lies. They've told them uh, stories of magic, of miracles, of don't worry now. Don't, I know your life is hell now, but you're going to get rewarded in the next life. Be a good Frenchman. Radicals sought to de-Christianize France because some Christians need to be forced to be free. By October of 1793, the convention attempted to de-Christianize France and establish a cult of reason. We're going to get to the cult of reason in a moment. They will close churches. They will persecute the clergy and believers and occasionally, occasionally force priests and nuns to marry. Some Christians need to be forced to be free. In place of the Roman Catholic Church, radicals, wanted to establish a cult of reason. This is going to be the replacement of Christianity in France. This new religion was based on the ideals of reason, virtue, liberty. This religion was supposed to be universal and to spread the ideas of the revolution. Liberty, equality, and fraternity were inscribed in their temples. Many churches were stripped. Many churches were stripped and re- a consecrated um, as temples to the cult of reason. This church was converted to a temple of reason and philosophy, carved on the side, liberty, equality, and fraternity. At one point, at one point, the um, Notre Dame, the Grand National Cathedral of France, was rededicated uh, in November of 1793 as the Temple of Reason. The Temple of Reason. Festivals were to be held where we celebrated the ideals of the Enlightenment, where philosophers replaced saints, where a supreme being replaced a Christian or a biblical god. That was seen as too abstract, this cult of reason, Humans need something, and so the cult of reason was replaced with the uh, cult of the supreme being. We need to give them something, and so this uh, will soon replace the cult of reason. The end objective is the same. We are trying to divorce the French people from their, from the, from the faith of their fathers, from the faith of their childhood, replacing it with something seen as much more reasonable, much more in line with the age of reason, with the enlightenment. And if you don't want to follow this supreme being, I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll get a hold of the public 
the 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 committee of public safety and and they'll help you we are ushering in a new age we are ushering in a new age and for this new age we can't be constrained by the past we can't be constrained by the past our years are based on jesus's uh, birth is it not and so the radicals within the french government established a new calendar they replaced the old calendar uh, with one beginning the day the republic was established literally a year zero 12 months of 30 days with names associated with seasons and the climate. Um, again, we are trying to re, we are trying to uh, uh, establish a new era, a new age in France and hoping that this will spread throughout Europe. The effects of this anti-Christian action and rhetoric and the establishment of the cult of the Supreme Being or the cult of reason, um, well, it faces massive opposition especially in the countryside. France is in the grip of a civil war, Paris versus the countryside. Most Frenchmen do not adopt these ideals, do not um, completely abandon the faith of their fathers. And so this increases uh, the civil war within France. This man, Maximilien Robespierre, came to dominate the Committee of Public Safety and in the end will act as the dictator of France during the radical phase of the French Revolution. He's the leader of the Committee of Public Safety, a shrewd and sensitive politician. Um, he's trained as a lawyer like his father had been and he um, was an advocate as a lawyer for the poor. And in 1799, when the Estates General are called up and their elections held all across France. Uh, he is elected to the Estates General. He's full of hope, promise. He wants to uh, help the people of his community. He becomes he becomes a Jacobin. He becomes a Jacobin. He becomes a radical, and he is completely committed to the teachings of Rousseau, whether it's a, a misunderstanding of Rousseau, historians continue to debate, but his understanding of Rousseau helps to sh uh, shape his political leanings. Um, he will view terror as a political tool. Remember, some men need to be forced to be free. He said this of terror. Terror is only justice, prompt, severe, and inflexible. It is then an emanation of virtue. He also said, quote, pity is treason. Pity is treason. Under Robespierre, the national razor is going to be put to use like never before. The national razor. What was the national razor? Well, as you can see, it's the guillotine. The guillotine. The reign of terror, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, manifested itself through tribunals. These tribunals put people on trial, and the mode of execution was the guillotine. The guillotine. This was invented by Joseph Guillotine, and it was seen as a Republican form of execution up until the guillotine. Up until the guillotine, uh, only the wealthy enjoyed being beheaded. You know, you might think, well, that's not a very nice thing. It is a nice thing because it's quick. And if done well, it's painless. You would even tip the executioner um, to make sure it was a clean cut. And they got to keep your clothes that you were wearing. And beheadings like this in France, it was done with a sword on your knee so you could die praying. This was seen as the most humane way of dying. And it was reserved for the nobles, only the nobles. And you would wear very expensive clothing. And so the executioner wants a clean cut and gets your clothes. Um, in England, they used the knack. But again, that was reserved for the nobility. If you were poor, and remember, 99% of us were poor, you were simply hanged. And usually these didn't go well. It wasn't a clean hanging. You were choked to death. 
The guillotine was seen as a Republican form of execution because everyone dies equally and everyone has a good, clean, quick death. The problem with the guillotine is no one gets tired. The guillotine is a very, very, very adept killing machine. And whereas a ax man could maybe execute six people a day, it takes a lot out of you. The guillotine can go on 24 hours a day and we can build a lot of them. And they do. And they will. Uh, the guillotine becomes the symbol of the French Revolution. Very efficient. The national razor. The first victim of these tribunals, these trials, if you want to call them trials, was Marie Antoinette, known as the Widow Capet. Remember, she's had her she's had her titles stripped from her. She's had her husband murdered. Oh, by the way, just so I can tell you, um, during the reign of terror, uh, 16,594 people were executed by the guillotine. 2,639 executions in Paris alone by the guillotine. Back to the widow. Following Louis' death, Marie Antoinette plunged into deep mourning. She's barely eating. Uh, she soon contracts uh, TB. Despite various attempts to get her out, and there were many plots to get her out to help her escape, she refuses to go because she refuses to leave her two children who are also imprisoned. October 14, she was finally tried by the Revolutionary Tribunal. Now, the king was given a, 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 a time to prepare a defense. She's not going to be given time. Within the day, she's brought to trial. Here she is in mourning, wearing black, barely eating, a, 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 a shadow of her former self, two weeks away from her 38th birthday. Here she is being dragged from her children. That is the crown prince of the Dauphin. She's being pulled away from him. She is going to be put on trial. Now, this is a show trial. This is a show trial. They accuse her of absolutely everything. Everything. She's accused of orchestrating orgies at Versailles, sending millions of French treasury money to Austria, plotting to kill the Duke of Orléans, declaring her son the new king of France, orchestrating massacres. The worst charge they made against her. And this is even, even the crowd that was watching this trial turned on the tribunal. You could hear people gasping. Women cried. They accused Marie Antoinette of incest with her son. Um, again, absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Um, but they want to humiliate her. Remember, that Austrian woman, that woman who partied as a peasant while my child starved. They want revenge. She is everything in the radicals' eyes that was bad with the aristocracy. She's found guilty. Her hair was cut off, and she was driven through Paris on an open cart wearing a plain white dress. At 12.15, October 16, she was beheaded at the place of the revolution. There she is. Dragged from her joke or sham of a trial. This is an actual sketch of someone who saw her there. The rest of these are just romantic paintings uh, painted in the 1800s. Her last words, her last words were, pardon me, sir. I meant not to do it. Uh, that's because she accidentally stepped on the executioner's foot um, while walking to her place of execution uh she loses her shoe this is her actual shoe that slipped off of her her body was thrown into an unmarked grave at the madeline cemetery uh, other members of the royal family cousins and so forth uh will soon meet the same fate this execution really kicks off the reign of terror this really kicks off the reign of terror 1793 to 1794, 10 months, 10 months, 500,000 Frenchmen and French women were arrested. 17,000 were officially executed. Now, 
25,000 will die in um, executions without a trial. Simply, many of these were simply shot in the country's side. Uh, altogether, approximately, we have no firm numbers on this, 40,000 will die in the reign of terror. People die for their political opinions, uh, for their political actions, for being merely suspected of being against the revolution, or sometimes someone just has it in for you. Perhaps they uh, are fond of your uh, wife. Perhaps they have your their eye on your land and they can report you and you can be investigated. On the slightest hint of evidence, you can be executed. Many killed, ironically, were revolutionaries themselves, but they were deemed not committed enough, not radical enough. The reign of terror. Thousands, thousands will meet their fate with the guillotine. These arguably are the lucky ones. Many were simply beat, shot, etc. These are massive shootings done during the reign of terror. Line them up, knock them down. Line them up, knock them down. But that's a waste of bullets. We need bullets for Austrians. And so the guillotine was preferred. The revolution is eating itself. The revolution is eating itself. Here, piled below the guillotine, are members of the nobility, certainly. But on the right, you'll see it was mostly common people. Mostly common people facing execution. Uh, also, all the way to the left, you can see the clergy. The clergy were also executed. If you were deemed to be an enemy of the state, an enemy of the general will, you too will meet a terrible, terrible fate. British propaganda during this time has completely turned on the revolution. The Jacobins must be stopped. God help Britain if this sort of revolutionary spirit should move across the channel into Britain. Britain is terrified that this, this, this virus will infect the British people. So much so they have to remind the British people. British liberty versus French liberty. In Britain in 1793, we have religion, morality, loyalty, obedience to the laws, independence, personal security, justice, inheritance, protection, property, industry, national prosperity, and happiness. What do you have in the French Revolution? Atheism, perjury, rebellion, treason, anarchy, murder, equality, madness, cruelty, injustice, Treachery, ingratitude, idleness, famine, national and private ruin, misery. Which is best, Great Britain? Remember that. Remember that. This is, this is propaganda against this revolution because the authorities are terrified all across Europe that this rebellious spirit will infect their borders. That's the whole reason why they're waging a war against the French. God help Britain if they should cross the channel and infect our beloved island. This is an artist's rendition of this is what's going to happen in Britain. If this spirit will cross over the channel, we have to fight them there so we don't fight them here. That is the justification for this war. What happens to Robespierre? Well, some historians argue that he certainly believed in what he was doing, and I completely agree with that. Um, was he alone responsible for the reign of terror? No. Was he used as a scapegoat in the years after the reign of terror? Uh, yeah, certainly. It's as if we couldn't blame just Hitler for the atrocities of the Second World War. He had a lot of help, and so did Robespierre. However, he begins to turn his terror on both radicals and moderates, both the left and the right. And if I never spoke about this, shame on me. The reason why we have left wing and right wing today, those terms, if someone's more conservative, they sit on the right. If someone's more uh, liberal, they sit on the left. Um, that comes from the old convention, the old uh, National Assembly, where more conservative members sat on the right and more uh, leftist uh, 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 members sat on the left. Just so you know, that's where that comes from. It's, we still use it. Uh, in 1794, at the height 
of his power. Robespierre um, delivers a speech. Um, it's it's an ill-tempered speech. He's attacking everyone in the speech. Um, and he's booed. He's booed during this speech. Uh, that night, that night, um, he's going to be arrested and he knows this. And so he tries to commit suicide. He tries to commit suicide by uh, shooting uh, himself in the uh, mouth. All it does is it destroys his his jaw. It's shattered. It's in splinters. You see, the radicals are afraid that they'll be the next to be uh, hunted down. And so they turn on Robespierre. Um, the revolutionaries turn on Robespierre. More conservative elements within the French government turn on Robespierre. He is dragged to the offices of the Committee of Public Safety. Uh, he's then thrown in the same cell that Marie Antoinette was thrown into. Uh, while laying on a table bleeding, uh, a doctor comes and attempts to uh, 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 stop his bleeding with his jaw. And the last recorded words that Robespierre uttered was, uh, thank you, sir, um, as someone gave him a handkerchief to put on his jaw. The next day, Robespierre is brought to the same spot where Marie Antoinette met her fate, um, along with 21 others. Um, and as he's brought up, there he is, number 10, you can see he's holding his chin. Uh, the executioner tears off the handkerchief, which is now dried on his shattered jaw, and he lets out the most uh, grotesque of screams. Um, he can't deliver any final words. He can't talk, um, and he is executed. This, along with the other 21 that are executed marks the end of the reign of terror. The end of the terror. By late summer of 1794, most of the provincial uprisings, most of the domestic uprisings had been crushed. And France begins to do well in the war, thanks to the levy system, thanks to that forced draft. This, along with the general feeling that enough blood had been shed, the terror uh, will soon end. France will now enter uh, the directory phase. What about the prince? What about Louis Charles of France? What's well, a terrible, it's a sad, sad story. Now, his brother had died, so he's the eldest living son. He was uh, uh, set to be the next king of France. Uh, Louis the Seventeenth. He grows up at Versailles. Uh, when the revolution kicks off, he is uh, moved back to Paris along with his mother and his father. Um, he will see his father executed. He won't witness it, but um, he will live with his mother at Temple Prison, and then his mother is dragged away. He then goes into the care of a uh, shoemaker a shoemaker, Antone Simone. Antone Simone, um, the cobbler was responsible for the prince's education, um, but the cobbler takes great pleasure in mocking the child, teasing the child. The guards treat this child terribly. They call him wolf cub, son of a tyrant, a bastard. They convince this young man that he was molested by his mother. He'll testify against his mother. It's complete rubbish. The kid's brainwashed. The kid is starved. He is starved. In 1795, when the revolutionaries are considering using him as a trading uh, uh, pawn with the Austrians, the Austrians have a lot of French soldiers. They can trade him. He is inspected by a doctor, um, and the doctor is shocked. The kid is unrecognizable. He's covered in sores. His stomach is distended from malnourishment. Before he can be traded, uh, he dies. He dies um, of TB. His sister uh, is traded to Austria, but she will die childless. She will die childless in 1851. There is the Dauphin being sent to heaven by an angel as France weeps. Um, the cobbler, the shoemaker, will actually be tried as an enemy of the revolution, and he will die that same day with Robespierre. 
the directory phase. 1795 to 1799. Unrelated. It's not his treatment of the Dauphin that gets him in trouble, just so you know. Unrelated. Um, the directory phase. The directory phase. This is a conservative reaction against the radicalism and bloodshed of the reign of terror. And it kicks off with the Th Thermidorian, pardon me, reaction. The Thermidorian reaction. This is a revolt within the French Revolution itself. This is a conservative revolt against the reign of terror. And it re refers to uh, their new calendar, just so you know. Um, it was triggered by a vote in the National Convention to execute Robespierre. That's what really kicks it off. Um, and it ends the radical phase of this revolution. Now, the influence of a generally wealthier, more middle class and professional class take the place of the sans culottes and the Jacobins. The Jacobin, Jacobins, the Jacobins um, are actually hunted down. They are hunted down. Their clubs are shut down. You can see in this image, um, they are... They become the enemy of a more conservative revolutionary government. Here are some Jacobins. Hundreds were hunted down and killed. Reforms under this directory phase. Well, the National Convention replaces the old convention of 1793. The old constitution had been fully democratic. Uh, if you recall, this new one will not. This one will not, although it was never fully democratic. On paper, it was. This new constitution of the year three uh, was a bicameral legislation. We now have two houses and a government heavily favoring property owners. The executive body is no longer the Committee of Public Safety. It's a five-person directory chosen from the upper house. A five-person directory chosen from the upper house. They introduced more individualized liberty, um, especially in the areas of religion. And in March of 1795, they signed a peace treaty with Spain and Prussia. Spain and Prussia are, for the time being, not enemies. And this allows France to focus more on the real enemy, Austria and Britain. At the same time, however, government policy paves the way for massive inflation, massive inflation. The government is in very, very, very ill health. And this helps to encourage or initiate more rebellions across France. And it's not just royalists. It's not just royalists. From 1794 to 1795, food riots break out across France. But the government squashes these. Furthermore, there are royalist rebellions, and the government completely squashes these as well. They call out the military. They call out the military. Uh, in many ways, the French government is now much more brutal to people rioting for bread than the king's government had been. For the first time in the revolution, artillery is being used against the French people. Grape shot is being used. What is grape shot? Well, it looks like grapes, a bunch of grapes. What it is, it's a bunch of mini cannonballs, sometimes just stones, placed in a sack or wrapped in wire. And when they shoot like a shotgun, they spread out. 1,400 counter-revolutionaries, French citizens, were once... Sorry about that. I had to pause it for a minute. I got a visit from the uh, Homeland Security. So one of you guys reported me. <laughs> All right, guys. Who was this man who killed 1,400 counter-revolutionaries with grape shot? Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte uh, was not afraid to turn the guns on counter-revolutionaries, royalists who are rebelling within France. Who was this young man? He was born to minor Italian aristocrats on the island of Corsica in 1769. Um, he's not French, but the island has been controlled by 
France since 1768. It was controlled by Genoa, the Italian city-state before. He would rise through the ranks as one of the greatest generals of all time, and he certainly was. When we speak of great generals, we speak of Alexander, we speak of Julius Caesar, we speak of Frederick the Great, and we have to speak of Napoleon. In England, in many circles to this day, he is vilified. You put him up there with Hitler because he plunged Europe into war. In France, he's remembered as a great man who helped to end feudalism across Europe and spread the ideals of the Enlightenment across Europe. Early years. In 1777, his father, a, a Corsican noble uh, and attorney, was named Corsica's representative to the court of Louis the Sixteenth, And so his father, Carlo Bonaparte, um, Napoleon will francicize his name to Bonaparte, but uh, the Corsican spelling is Bonaparte, um, will move to France. He will move to France. Here is the Mediterranean, is that small island of Corsica. There you go, I've circled it. Now, this is the equivalent of being from the hills of Kentucky. Um, Corsica is and has never been a major player in European affairs. He will speak with a Corsican accent. Uh, they don't speak French. They do now, um, but they spoke Corsican, uh, a kind of uh, Italian uh, language, and he will have a heavy accent for the rest of his life. He can't get rid of it. He'll be teased mercilessly um, as, uh, as a child in France. Backwaters, backwaters, minor nobility, a minor noble. This is the home he was born. This is the Napoleon home. Um, you can still visit it. It is now a museum on the island of Corsica, but he leaves, he leaves Corsica as a child, um, and he goes to France. He goes to France. His father, again, is Corsica's representative to the court, to the royal court of Louis the Sixteenth. As a young man, as a young man, his family is fairly connected, minor nobility, again, uh, he is sent to the military Academy at Brienne La Chateau outside of Paris. He then goes to the very esteemed Ecole uh, Militaire uh, in Paris. This is a very this is this is this is France's West Point, um, where he becomes an expert. Uh, he trains as a artillery officer, and he's going to use he's going to use the uh, ar artillery um, in new ways. Uh, although in some ways copying Frederick the Great, who who really. Um, spearheads this new way of, 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 of using artillery uh, in war. As a young man, he will sympathize with the Jacobins. Um, he will become somewhat of a radical as a young man. And he also spends a tremendous amount of time reading. He was known to be a prolific reader. He once said, show me a family of readers and I will show you the people who move the world. So committed to reading was Napoleon. He actually had printed for himself uh, books, printed small, many books that he could take on campaign with him. Uh, remember, when you're on campaign, uh, you have to pack lightly. And so he would bring with him uh, uh, these many books that he could read. He was a prolific reader, reading four books at a time. Personality. Well, all historians, even historians that aren't very glowing of Napoleon, uh, point to his remarkable personality as uh, one giant reason for his rise. And he will rise very, very quickly. Although not physically imposing, in one-on-one -on -one situations, he was said to have put people in almost a hypnotic trance. He could bend the most stubborn of leaders to his will. He wasn't short. That is British propaganda. And um, because Napoleon always surrounded himself with tall elite guards, his personal bodyguards who all had to be at least six foot and then wore big hats, he might have appeared short, but he wasn't short. For his age, he was quite average in height, just so you know. Uh, as far as religion goes, I'll give you a few quotes to give you insight into what he thought about religion. He said, quote, religion is excellent stuff for keeping common people quiet. Religion is excellent stuff for keeping common people quiet. Remember, you're not going to get 
awarded in this world, but in the next world, you'll be in heaven. He said, religion is what keeps the poor from murdering the rich. If I had to choose a religion, the sun as the universal giver of life would be my God. That is very enlightenment. He is a child of the enlightenment. He had a photographic memory. He had a photographic memory. And it is said that he could speak to thousands of his troops about things that he learned about them. Imagine how powerful it would be if you're just a lowly soldier in line and Napoleon walks past you and says, how's your wife, Maria? You knew that about me? Yeah. He was incredibly inspiring to his troops and not afraid to put himself in danger. He oftentimes, and even other officers would say, Napoleon, stop putting yourself in the front. Stop putting yourself in the front. Um, but his troops loved him for it. Loved him for it. Wellington, the enemy of Napoleon, the British, Wellington said one Napoleon was worth 40,000 soldiers, meaning if Napoleon is here in this battle, I have to estimate that the French have an additional 40,000 men. That's how inspiring he was to his men. He just Napoleon being present because he couldn't be at all battles at all times, obviously, um, was worth 40,000 men. He stayed up all night reading reports, memorizing records, studying maps. He was entirely committed and he was brilliant um, mentally. Uh, he had a photographic memory, I guess. I, I, I could have just said that. Completely committed to his uh, objective. He also was a firm believer in luck. A firm believer in luck. Was he superstitious? I suppose he was. Any believer in luck would be. But he believed that... Um, he was born under a lucky star, but that's not good enough. You need to act on it. But he believed that he was born under a lucky star. He would have generals or sorry, officers brought before him for promotion. And he'd want to know, yeah, but is he lucky? He said, I would rather have a general who is lucky than a general who is good. He is a firm believer in luck. And he believed that he was born under a lucky star, that fate was on his side. Ascent to power. In six years, the man rises from a lowly brigadier general to the uh, de facto ruler of France. In, during the reign of terror, um, he's very sympathetic to Robespierre. He's friends with Robespierre's brother. And when the reign of terror is over, he's almost arrested and put to death because of his connections to Robespierre's brother. But what makes him famous in France was his action against the counter-revolutionaries. The fact that with a whiff of grape shot, as he put it, he put down 1,400 royalists and suppressed all other counter-revolution. This is what makes him somewhat of a celebrity in Paris, at least. His use of counter-revolutionary, uh, 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 counter-royalist action. This is a man who's not afraid to kill fellow Frenchmen. He's not afraid to kill uh, anti-revolutionaries, royalists. He will meet and fall completely in love with Josephine. Now, Josephine was five years older than Napoleon, much more worldly than Napoleon. Very French, very connected. She's going to open a lot of doors for him through her connections. She's in kind of a desperate spot. She has two children. Her husband's been killed through the reign of terror. Um, and she, at first, doesn't particularly care for Napoleon. He's much more into her than she is of him. Um, but they will become uh, very much a loving couple. One of the love stories in history. Napoleon believes that she is his lucky charm. With Josephine, I can do anything. As long as I don't leave or lose Josephine, I can do anything. He marries Josephine and uh, is entirely in love with her. You can still read his letters to Josephine that he writes from the front. And she writes back kind of indifferently, but he is passionately in love with her. And as long as he has Josephine, he has his lucky charm.
The Italian campaign. The Italian campaign. Napoleon is put in charge of the Italian forces. These are French forces headed to and fighting in Italy. Two days after he marries Josephine, he is sent to northern Italy to fight the Austrians. The Austrians control much of northern Italy, and we are taking the battle to them. We are taking the battle to them. Again, he puts himself in danger. He fights incredibly well, and he defeats the Austrians. Now, it's not a, a, a total victory. The Austrians are still in the fight, but he uh, pushes the Austrians out of northern Italy. He forces them to sign a treaty, which results in the Austrians losing not only northern Italy, but the low countries up in modern-day uh, Belgium. He then enters Venice. He enters Venice. Now, Venice has been independent for 1,100 years. They've been able to beat off the Austrians, but not Napoleon. He conquers the Venetians. He conquers the Venetians, ending 1,100 years of independence. So now we've taken Northern Italy, including Venice. He is a hero to the French people. There is the French flag of the revolution in Venice. The whole time he's fighting in Italy, he is paying for two newspapers to be printed. One is for his own troops, so they can learn of uh, uh, their victories, and um, it creates a, a patriotic spirit. It increases loyalty to Napoleon, but he also creates a newspaper to be read back in France. This is a propaganda tool telling the French people of his victories, of his daring uh, 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 maneuvers. This is propaganda. This is brilliant. This is a this is a card right out of, this is a page right out of Julius Caesar, who did the same thing when he was fighting in France against the uh, Gauls. He would send reports back to Rome the whole time. And that made the Roman people love him. And this is what Napoleon does, sending reports back, back, back. Napoleon then turns his sights on Egypt. He turns his sights on Egypt. He realizes that he can't defeat the British in the open waters. The French don't have the Navy. He can't invade Britain. But what he can do is harass British forces in Egypt and cut off their communication and their supply from India. India has become their most important uh, uh, imperial possession at this time. You see... Um, much of the goods that are shipped from Italy, uh, from India, British controlled Italy, come through the Red Sea, taken off of the ships, and then reloaded in the Mediterranean. Um, this is before the Suez Canal, but it still works for the British. If I can take Egypt, then I can cut the British off, or at least cripple their imperial possessions in. India. He also wants to join with Muslim forces in India against the British and Muslim forces in uh, the Ottoman Empire against the British. This is his hope. He wants to cut the British off from their possessions in India, or at least make it more difficult to access them. So he fights the British in India. He wants to take control of Egypt. Napoleon in Egypt has captured the imagination of many a painter. These are not from the time. These are from the 1800s. But they are very beautiful. It's very romantic, the thought of, of Napoleon in Egypt among the Sphinx, the, the, the pyramids. Now, being a child of the Enlightenment, not only does Napoleon bring soldiers and cannons to Egypt on this campaign, he brings with him um, scientists, geologists to study Egypt. Now, Egypt's been a part of the European consciousness since Christianity, because it's mentioned so much in the Bible. But this is really a rediscovery of, of Egypt. Europeans, for the most part, had forgotten about Egypt. This study, this study um, will reignite interest in Egypt. Naturalists, mathematicians. When you go and you see the Sphinx today, it's not like 
it was. This was covered in dirt. This was covered in dirt in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Only later was it revealed that it was actually a on the head uh, on the body of a giant lion that was covered in dirt. When Napoleon was there, it was up to its chin. There is a myth that Napoleon's troops uh, shot off its nose. That's not true. That's not true. The greatest discovery when it comes to the study of Egyptology was the Rosetta Stone. French troops find this stone. What it is, is it's three inscriptions done in three different alphabets. One is hieroglyphic. The next is Coptic Egyptian, which is much more everyday uh, written language of the Egyptians. And the last one is in Greek. This allows for the first time in thousands of years, because they're all the same writing on this uh, giant, giant uh, bit of granite. It allows Europeans or anyone, no one could do it at this point. Egyptians had long lost their understanding of hieroglyphics to read these hieroglyphics. The Rosetta Stone allowed people for the first time in many thousands of years to read these hieroglyphics, which is absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. The British will later steal the uh, Rosetta Stone from the French and bring it to London where it currently sits, I believe. Napoleon in Egypt reawakens, or it doesn't reawaken, it awakens an absolute obsession with, uh, with Egypt. The 1800s was obsessed with Egypt, and it really gets kicked off with Napoleon's um, arrival there. Egyptian-style furniture, jewelry. In the later 1800s, Europeans will visit Egypt. We become obsessed with Egypt in the 1800s. You can see here, by the time this photograph, late 1800s was taken, the Sphinx has been exposed. The Victorians in Europe, well, in Britain, France, the United States, people become obsessed with Egypt. Egyptomania, it was called. Now, this Egyptomania was very, very, very big in this country. Um, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. When in the middle 1800s, we wanted to honor our first president, the father of the United States, what do we do? What do we build for this man? We go with an obelisk. That is an Egyptian monument that we will build for our beloved president. The Washington Monument is entirely Egyptian in its design. 1848, we get the cornerstone laid. It takes a long time to come up with the funding, but we do it little by little. Here is close to completion, 1884. This is the view from the Washington Monument down onto the Capitol. Enough about Washington, though. Let's get back to Egypt. The Egyptian campaign actually goes quite badly for Napoleon. It goes quite badly. He is uh, not only fighting the British, he's fighting the Ottomans. Um, his troops get sick. A plague infects his army. Um, he is not doing well. He is not doing well, and the British actually inflict a severe defeat on Napoleon at the Battle of the Nile. The Battle of the Nile sees the British defeat Napoleon, and he has to run away uh, back to France. This should have ruined him. This should have ruined him uh, politically, but it doesn't. It doesn't. This is the British terrified of this new menace. Here he is in Egypt. We have to get him there before he brings these ideals back to. He's not the leader of France yet, but he is a rising star that the British are terrified of. When he sneaks back into France, he is shocked and greatly angered that his wife has spent a ridiculous amount of money on a mansion just outside of Paris on uh, 150 acres. Chateau de Malmaison um, is something he can't afford. She's reckoning that he's going to return with a bunch of money. He doesn't. He yells at her. What are you doing? 
This is going to cost a fortune to renovate, and it does. But in the end, uh, he and Josephine make a good little life at this chateau. Many good memories will be made at this chateau. When he returns, the directory wants him arrested, but the directory is very unpopular. Napoleon is still incredibly popular. The war is doing better. The war is doing better outside of Egypt. Uh, the French have again defeated the Austrians, and now the Russians they've defeated. Yes, the Russians have jumped in against the French. Napoleon helps to initiate a coup d'etat. He has the support of the military, and the directory is overthrown. The directory is overthrown. They wanted to put him on trial for desertion. Technically, he deserts his Egyptian forces and returns to France. They're too weak. He overthrows them because he has the support of the military. A tribunal, a tribunal is put together, a three-member tribunal. Uh, that's redundant, right? All tribunals are three members, but it's a consulship. It's supposed to be an equal consulship with Napoleon being one. The two others thought they could control Napoleon. They're very, very wrong. And it soon becomes apparent that no, 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 this isn't going to be a tribunal. There's going to be one. And that's going to be me. First consul. First consul. The other two are just uh, advisors. They're advisors. They're consultants. Napoleon quickly rewrites the establishment, the uh, formation of this consulship with him at the first, um, and he will be first consul for 10 years. Um, he puts it to the people, and overwhelmingly, the French people agree. We want you to be first consul. We want you to be first consul. Uh, overwhelmingly vote in favor of Napoleon. The effects, well, this new constitution, rewritten by Napoleon, um, has the appearance of a republic. It has the appearance of a republic. But in reality, it establishes a military dictatorship. Julius Caesar would do the same thing. On paper, it was a republic. Uh, I don't want to connect. I don't want to draw too much of a parallel between this man and Hitler, but Hitler would do the same thing. It had the appearance of a representative government. But in reality, Napoleon is now a military dictator. And it will be Napoleon that spreads the ideals like a poison, like a wildfire across Europe. That is for another lesson. Thank you all very, very, very much until we meet again.